Here we go. So last week, for those who were here, we started on the chapter called Establishing an Equitable Society, which comes at the very end of this wonderful book called Social and Communal Harmony by the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, but really by the Buddha. And it's the way that it's been organized that is rather ingenious from Bhikkhu Bodhi's side. And we've already covered so many things, <clears throat> personal training, um, what real friendship means, what uh, anger is and how destructive it is, how to resolve conflicts, overcome resentment, etc. So now we're all ready and equipped to establish an equitable society, which is, of course, what we try to do with a monastery. It's a mini society, if you like. And um, as I said on this BBC show, <laughs> we're on the BBC um, today, on the BBC World Service, for those who haven't heard it, but... Uh, I made the point that uh, that a monastery is like a, a, a beautiful society in the sense that runs on the principles of democracy and mm. harmony and mutual respect. Um, and so the Buddha was really um, incredible mm. because he he actually developed the Sangha to embody the Dhamma through the way they lived in community and mm. also had a lot of advice for the way society runs as well. So these mm. principles really help anyone no matter what sort of side of society or part of society you're in and uh, last week we just mentioned that there are six different things to be regarded as the six directions and that basically meant six kinds of relationship and the Buddha gave guidelines on each one of these relationships to say um, how they would ideally live together in a way that made um, a particular direction, so that particular relationship secure and free from peril. And the six um, things to be regarded as the six directions were mother and father, and teachers, and then wife and children, and friends and companions. Then we had servants, workers and helpers, and lastly, ascetics and Brahmins. So last week we got through the part on the parents and children. And this week we're starting with um, how pupils should minister to their teachers. But I don't know, is it worth me reading the first bit again for those who were not here last week? And even those who were, perhaps I'll start mm. with the whole thing. Mm. Yeah? Mm. Okay. So this is called Reciprocal Responsibilities, and the Buddha is speaking to a young man named Sigalaka. And how, young man, does the noble disciple protect the six directions? These six directions are to be regarded as the six directions. So that's what I just mentioned. And there are five ways in which a son should minister to his mother and father in the eastern direction. He or she or they should think, having been supported by them, I will support them. I will perform their duties for them. I will keep up the family tradition. I will be worthy of my heritage. After my parents' deaths, I will distribute gifts on their behalf. And there are five ways which the parents, so ministered to by their child, as the Eastern direction, will reciprocate. They will restrain them from evil, support them in doing good, teach them some skill, find them a suitable partner, <laughs> and in due time, hand over their inheritance to that child. So I'm trying to make it gender neutral because this is always in the male voice, which I think is a little bit exclusive. In this way, the eastern direction is covered, making it secure and free from peril. So that was the paragraph we took a whole uh, sort of discussion on last week. So you're all experts in that. And now we're going on to the five ways in which pupils should minister to their teachers. So now the Buddha's uh, describing this as the southern direction. It's a way of remembering. So there are five ways in which pupils should minister to their teachers as the southern direction. Number one, by rising to greet them. Number two, by waiting on them. Number three, by being attentive. 
Number four, by serving them. And number five, by mastering the skills they teach. And there are five ways in which their teachers, thus ministered to by their pupils as a southern direction, will reciprocate. They will give thorough instruction. Make sure they've grasped what they should have duly grasped. Give them a thorough grounding in all skills. Re recommend them to their friends and colleagues and provide them with security in all directions. In this way, the southern direction is covered, making it secure and free from peril. But I really like this because I have a very wonderful relationship that I'm incredibly blessed with and incredibly grateful for with my teacher. And I just read this before coming to share it with you and, and thought, gosh, actually, my teacher is doing all those things for me. And I find so much joy in doing those things back. And some of these things are things we can do in the moment, but others take a long time. Mastering the skills that a teacher teaches is a process. You know? So it's important not to feel that we have to be doing these things perfectly from the outset, because the purpose of a teacher is that they train you over time. And the practice takes time to really sink in and start to work and start to um, take seed and take root, really, and um, produce those fruits that it's aimed at. Um, but it's really lovely because although here it's talking about um, serving our teacher, and I know how much joy that can bring me, there are also some um, protections in the Vinaya that talk about um, how bhikkhunis shouldn't always wait on monks, which is really nice. So some of the things that I would like to do for Ajahn Brown, for example, wash his robe or give him water while he's eating are actually not allowed, mm. which is interesting, mm. isn't it? Because it seems to me as though there are like um, preventions in, in the Vinaya itself um, to stop the exploitation of the bhikkhuni sangha. Because, of course, we're supposed to be, uh, although you might be a pupil of somebody, there's also that gender bias that it's easy to slip into those roles. And it's easy for perhaps for monks as well and men in general to take advantage of traditional female roles, especially in the time of the Buddha, which were very, mm. um, very much delineated. You know, as a woman had the roles in the house and to maintain the house and look after the servants and rise before the parent-in-law and the, and the husband and the man's role was more to um, bring in the, the earnings from the livelihood that he would do. So um, I find this very beautiful. And uh, I also find it something really natural if we have devotion towards the teacher, mm -hmm. you know, by rising to greet them. Mm -hmm. I mean, if somebody comes along who you respect, it's natural, isn't it, to rise up mm -hmm. and to, to, to greet them and then to wait on them you know, in whatever way you can, mm. by being attentive. So by really um, looking for what they might need, you know, and even anticipating, you know, perhaps they're thirsty and they're not having their meal, so then you are allowed to give them a drink. <laughs> um, mm. But really by noticing what it is they need. And I think one way that I've noticed people serving that's really um, supportive towards Ajahn Brown, but also towards me, is that when you don't have to say too much, people just pick it up, you know. And some of the guests, I mean, all of them, all of the guests that stay, I, I notice them sort of, you know, mm. being very keenly attentive and sort of noticing if you haven't had um, a drink or whatever mm. it might be. Mm. And by serving them. Just reading this gives me so much joy. Because I love to find any opportunity I can to serve my teacher. And I don't get that many opportunities. <laughs> and I always remember how Ajahn Bam said, you know, he used to jump at any opportunity to serve Ajahn Chah. Mm -hmm. But then he'd remember that he's not really serving Ajahn Chah. There's very little he can do. Right? Really, it's the teacher who's serving us because they're giving us the greatest gift of the Dhamma. Okay. Ajahn Bam's 
favorite story yeah. about getting one of Ajahn Chah's toes. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> John Sally. Oh well. Well, it was when he was had first come to Thailand and he was a sort of, you know, democratic educated young man who thought that we who where things had to be rostered. Why don't we all, you know, have a <laughs> roster for a the roster. <laughs> roster for what when when Ajahn Chah comes through the door, everyone runs to wash his feet. He said, "What a silly group of people! Why don't we just have a roster and take turns? You know, you do it one day, I do it one day, why I do?" And he thought one day he'd just join everybody in this rush <laughs> to wash Ajahn Chah's feet, and. Well, he got hold of a toe. <laughs> he got a whole toe. But the joy it brought him. <laughs> yeah, the joy it brought him to have served and to have washed a whole toe. <laughs> but yes, it's it's our happiness, isn't it? To yeah, have served. It gives exactly. you joy. I don't know what it is to look after somebody who you have so much uh, um, faith in and who has helped you yeah. so much so yeah and in a sense you're helping them to spread the dhamma I mean that's the joy of it I mean when Ajahn Brown's here you know and I'm serving mm -hmm. him I'm kind of making sure the trains are all on time and mm -hmm. you know making sure he's had his food or whatever and you know something suitable for his stomach and uh, trying to get to know exactly what he likes and give him lots of rest you know because most of his life he doesn't get much rest nor do I actually but um <laughs> But it just gives you joy because then you know that by doing that, you're actually helping to spread the Dhamma. Right? And I think this is the beauty of serving the Dhamma, however you're doing it. Even if you think you're just doing something really menial, like stocking the fridge or cleaning the floor, you're actually helping spread the Dhamma. Even today we had someone come around to look at this um, Vihara because unfortunately, having painted the walls and filled it with good energy, we have to sell. We have to sell so that we can buy the new monastery property and uh we had somebody come to look at it and i just felt it really important to make it clean and it's not just for the sake of you know giving them a good impression it's kind of like i feel like um what's the word like um a custodian or something of the space like it belongs to the kuni sangha and i want to present it in a fitting way because this has been offered by people and i want it to kind of somehow show that care you know show that it's been loved and I I kind of feel like it changes the energy and it's not just physical there's something about the beings that rejoice even the invisible beings that rejoice in that atmosphere and people walk through the door at least people that come to stay in it as a vihara um, and they say they feel something you know they feel a sense of peace so all of this is service to the Dhamma, service to the teacher. And it's a really joyful mm. thing to do when we think about it. You know, it's so much more than the mm. task at hand. So the question is, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to um, come to Kilaya. See what you have to say. I, I, I like this topic because of the I've, I had a chance to live in India in an ashram in a traditional Hindu guru uh, disciple relationship for a very long time. Mm. And it's interesting um, how rich this tradition is mm. and how new it is to us Westerners, really. Mm. I mean, like you said, it's natural to rise for a teacher out of respect. And mm. I think in the West, we've had that to a large degree, but I think in India, it was, there was even more love, you know, like you said, the devotion and the service where you're really dedicating your life to whatever the teacher thinks is important. You know, if the teacher has a project to say, feed homeless people or start a hospital to serve that teacher, you got involved in that project, you know, that project became your project. Yeah. So whatever whatever the teacher's preferences were, they became yours. And uh, and interestingly enough, the first really appearance in Indian texts of the word guru comes from the suttas. There's no prior use of that word in any Hindu scripture. 
Um, so it is, it, it, you know, obviously the, the Buddha was referring to the tradition that already existed in the day, um, but it's obviously something he was very aware of and, and definitely approved of, I think. From yeah. What yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> I also started my practice in India um, a long time ago and lived there for like the best part of 15 years. <laughs> And um, it was just so natural, as you say, you know, to see that kind of reverential respect. And it's just a very beautiful relationship. I mean, for me, the relationships with my teachers and I've had, you know, a few. I've been so blessed, you know, to have people that I really feel I can put my full trust in. And of course, you don't do that blindly just on superficial appearances. You look at them and you practice what they teach and you, you know, you watch the way they are for a long time. And I'm not talking about whether you like their personality or whether they, you know, are perfect, but just, you know, that their virtue should be really, really strong. And, you know, there should be a sense of integrity there that what you see is what you get, you know, and they're honest about their weaknesses and uh, and also have some qualities that you can really um, respect and aspire to. But, um, yeah, it's one of the most beautiful relationships in my life. I think friendship's another one. And, you know, ideally, um, a teacher will also be a spiritual friend. They won't look down on you. They will treat you with a lot of respect. But um, there's something close to, it's a kind of, it's more than love. The word love doesn't do it. The word love almost feels like it's a, a, degrade, a degrading the depth of that emotion. It's something really reverential. And I think that's because ideally you're revering the capacity for awakening that you yourself have. Mm within you know that all beings actually have within so yeah it's a it's a very beautiful thing yeah please um, so and tabs from here wants to speak i guess expanding a bit on that i'm wondering what your relationship like is to having complicated feelings about a teacher mm -hmm. say they are you know somebody you know you can learn from but mm -hmm. they do also look down on you and it makes serving them frustrating, something like that. Right, yeah. Yeah. Did everyone hear that question? Great. Yeah, when they look down on you. I mean, I guess. That's fine. Um, yeah, what was the first part again, sorry? Yeah, I guess if you. But you do respect them and you've learned. You, yeah. You are learning from them. And, exactly. Yeah. And yet you feel they look down on you. I mean, firstly, I think. No teacher is going to be perfect. And also we have to question our perception a little bit. Like, are we sure that that's what's happening? Or is it bringing up a kind of sense of inferiority mm -hmm. in ourselves? But then it might be also worth seeing the way they treat others and seeing if that looks like a pattern, mm -hmm. just for the sense of objectivity. Um, and, I mean, ideally, a teacher shouldn't be doing that. But then... The thing is, until <clears throat> someone's on the third stage of enlightenment, which is pretty high, they still have a sense of conceit. Mm -hmm. And so all of us in some way think of ourselves as either superior or inferior or the same as others. And we're always measuring in a sense. Mm -hmm. So I guess it depends on the extent of that. And yeah, and whether that's actually starting to damage you at all. And if it is, I would say protect yourself. Mm -hmm. Um if it's someone you feel you have a, an open relationship with I mean with my teacher I, I tell him if I have doubts I just say mm. to him you know this is what I'm saying this is how you said it I meant it I felt this way I felt that way why don't you let nuns come and stay if you're so you know I say sometimes things and sometimes it's I feel you know it, it's like you go through things mm. in your life especially doing something of this magnitude that I'm trying to do on my own I've been through a lot of struggles and I just go to him with everything I mean obviously not every moment of the day because that would totally overwhelm any teacher but in the time that he's given me to talk to him I will just address my very real concerns mm -hmm. so I think that's possible but again there has to be a lot of trust for that mm -hmm. and it's not something you do straight away it's like something you sort of yeah you build that trust over time, mm -hmm. I suppose. But yeah, yeah, I mean, there are cases where teachers totally exploit disciples, mm -hmm. right? And there's an abuse of power. Most part, it's 
a bit in the middle, you know, mm. not perfect and yeah. and not entirely bad either. Just yeah. another human being trying to do the best they know how yeah. and having bad moods sometimes yeah, and yeah. being tired sometimes yeah, yeah. and yeah, can't yeah. expect perfection from them. Yeah. 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 Understanding that they're also human. Right. And getting and to know done. people because it's so easy to judge, especially what can happen as well is when we sort of think of someone as a teacher, we just project all our wishes mm. for mm. how they'll be onto yeah. them. Yeah. And um if they don't kind of quite fulfill those wishes, we suddenly turn them into something else, <laughs> you know, and, and that's not mm. true either. So, I mean, just like any human being, we have to get to know them as people and, mm. you know, understand that they are people um, and understand where they're coming from. I mean, one of the things I once did, because I saw my teacher in Burma get angry and I was shocked at the mm. time because I'd never seen that before. And I knew he was, you know, well on the path um, and full of metta. But there was this one time that things kind of didn't go right. And he actually got hold of a cop and threw it at his nephew across the Dumber Hall. It was like a metal cop. And there was like a fierceness in his face. And I mean, it was kind of like, you know, <laughs> but we were all kind of so much in our meditation. It was just like, you just watched it and waited and thought, okay. And uh, and quite soon after that, I realised that, okay, he's not an hat, which I know. So, you know, anger can still arise. And I realised that the role he was in was something I would never be able to get close to. I mean, I would have probably lost my fuse way before that, you know. This is somebody who's about to teach, like, a retreat to 80 people, and the nephew's messed about listening to the radio, breaking the rules in the monastery, <laughs> and hasn't organised all the, I think it was either the electricity or the seating or something really crucial to the retreat. And um, I don't know, maybe he was being kind of cheeky. Who knows? But I just realised that with that much responsibility and pressure, I mean, I wouldn't even think of being in that role, you know. So how could I judge? And I never saw that again, but um, I did speak to Ajahn Brahm about it once after I heard it had happened. And um, I'd only just met Ajahn Brahm. I was on my first or second retreat and I told him and I was kind of, you know, a bit upset. And um, and he just immediately, his eyes just turned to like this beautiful compassion. He just said, oh, well, you know, it's kind of, yeah, it's par for the course. It was the look in his eyes. He didn't really say very much, but it was just the look of kind of total understanding and compassion. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, most people aren't ever hats. So that was really nice. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, someone's asking, maybe our hats can be considered perfect. I mean, maybe some people do consider them perfect, but some people don't like them. I mean, look at Devadatta and the way he treated the Buddha. I mean, Devadatta would have thought that was his cousin, right? He would have thought the Buddha was, I don't know what, power obsessed or wrong for, you know, not saying that all his disciples should be vegetarian. I mean, we all have views and we're not going to be liked by everybody. And I think part of the practice for me anyway, in my role with a lot of pressures and stuff, is realising that I just can't please everybody. And, you know, um, it's not my job to either. So I don't know if anyone, I don't know about perfect. I mean, they're free from greed, hate and delusion. This is a thing. So they don't come from a place of defilement. They might do things that upset other people. They might have characteristics that irritate us. Um, they might even be unskillful sometimes in what they say, but, you know, maybe they say something that's not helpful or they don't act in a way that could have helped someone. But the thing is, there's no delusion, there's no greed, there's no hate. So the motivation is very pure. I think that's probably the difference. Mm. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, now it has to be perfect. I don't think the goal is to be perfect, you know. I think the goal of this path is not to perfect a self. Yes, yes. It's actually to see through this, yeah, yeah, no the self. delusion of a self. <laughs> <laughs> to see that yeah. whatever we take as a self yeah. is actually entirely conditioned. And, um, yeah, it's just nature mm -hmm. manifesting according to its conditions. Sorry, can I 
let's see something about the have this question. Mm. Um, you know, in the Vinaya, there's strangely enough, the relationship between the teacher and the student is described quite differently to this, because mm. that's kind of um, possibly a pitfall that ha that happens in a relationship between teacher and student. The your 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 preceptor, the person who ordains you, is supposed to look after your health, take care of you when you're sick. Um, if you make uh, uh, break one of the rules, advise you, send you on the right track, all this kind of thing. And then it describes the duties of the student to the teacher, and it's exactly the same. Mm. It's it's exactly the same when they are going on the wrong track. Send them in the right direction. Give them advice. Look after their health. It's it's uh, so the idea of a guru doesn't exist mm. in the vinya of someone who you blindly follow their advice, whoever they are. Uh, your preceptor is just a fellow monastic mm. who you advise in the same way if they fall into problems. So I, I, that's really interesting that that is for the the vinya who your preceptor is in according to the vinya mm. yeah yes mm. although yeah. preceptor can be different from the teacher yeah preceptor can be different from the yeah. teacher yeah yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but there is there isn't something called is there something called the teacher in the yeah the acharya yeah acharya in the vinya right right and that's the one who's your preceptor. Ideally, the teacher yeah. and the preceptor are the same. same. Mm. But I think but teachers yeah. can be anyone, can't they? Yeah. I mean, our this fellow monastics can our... be our teachers. Exactly. So this in that sense, it's different. In authority, the person right. who has given you the going forth, who is a sort of the authority in, in the monastery. Right. Your, your relationship with them is just like they look after you, you look after them. And so you're not putting anyone on a place of power that takes away your power as well mm -hmm. interestingly yeah it's, it's different from the from the hindu idea of guru mm -hmm. definitely mm -hmm. but i still think there should be a reverence for a teacher yeah yeah at least for the yeah. teachings i'm going to go to some questions yes. and comments now because a few people are um, wanting to join in the discussion so um i don't usually read names um from the box because just in case you want it to be confidential um so growing up i got the sense that my mainstream mainstream school teachers had better relationships these things are always in the way <laughs> with the most confident well-spoken and outgoing students it's refreshing that the teachings are praising quiet servitude that's true isn't it yeah 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 I wonder you know because I don't know it's true in a sense those that speak up and that are most confident seem to get the most attention right because they're the ones that are actually kind of communicating and asking questions and in a way I can understand that because when people want to engage, then you respond, you know, as a teacher, you're not actually having preferences. You're just responding to whatever comes around. And I think it doesn't necessarily mean that um, it's a better relationship. It, it can mean just that they're responding to a need. Um, and yeah, quiet servitude, that's a beautiful way to put it. I do think that's really valuable. I mean, in my role, I can honestly say that that is probably um more sustainable <laughs> for me I mean and also for Ajahn Brahm you see the people he keeps around are very quiet they go about things without asking him very much at all sometimes they ask a question but they always check that it's a good time you know they don't just kind of jump on him the moment he turns up and you know it starts sort of talking and asking things because that's that's really exhausting and it's also not that respectful in a sense you know because a teacher is not just there to serve our needs they're also again a human being who needs the time to um for privacy as well so I think quiet servitude is beautiful and uh, I mean many teachers I've seen some bikunis who are really strict and 
the people that live with it, I won't do this, I promise, to anyone, but the people that live with them aren't allowed to speak unless they're spoken to, literally. And if they're sort of, um, you know, the monastery steward and, and some guests come along from outside, they're not allowed to engage in the discussion. They just have to be in the kitchen cleaning up and they're not allowed to actually express themselves unless the teacher asks them to, which is very strict. And I don't think that's necessarily the way either. But, um, yeah, I suppose ideally we're all trying to develop humility and attentiveness. So I do think there's a lot to be said for that. What do you think? Have you seen that as well? Like people just quietly serving? Of course, of course. (laughs) Ubekin, this is Sayaji Ubekin, this is my first teacher's teacher, was famous for losing his temper, in inverted commas, but without rolling in the emotion or making a sankara from it. (laughs) Mm-hmm. So just to explain the language there is that um, in that tradition, um, we we used to use, or Goenkaji used to use the word sankara to mean a reaction or um, some kind of comic imprint in the mind. So it basically meant, um, yeah, kind of generating um, negativities like anger or, or craving or ill will. Um, so apparently he could show anger or he he could show strong speech or, you know, speak quite sharply, but there wasn't actually any underlying kind of force to that. There wasn't any negativity there. And I feel that too. Sometimes I have to sort of, because I don't like actually asking people what to do. So sometimes it comes out a bit, uh, but there's nothing like it's actually, there's only goodwill, you know? So that is also possible, although I do question whether it's skillful to kind of shout, you know, or lose the temper in that way. Yeah. I think once I did in Thailand, because they'd um, kind of cheated us with a bus ticket and uh, we were stuck. And I remember saying to myself, well, I'm not really angry. It's almost amusing, but I'll shout at them. (laughs) And I kind of was like, you can't do this. You need to give us a refund. And they did. (laughs) <laughs> I think they organised a taxi actually because uh, yeah <laughs> and another time in India that was worse because I was actually flashed at in the middle of a very deserted beach and um, there was nobody there at all I was with a female friend and suddenly there were these two guys appeared from nowhere and one's flashing at me in the sea and I just obviously raced back to the shore and yelled my lungs out at him again I wasn't actually angry but I guess I was a bit frightened but I just wanted to really make him know that that wasn't okay. And he looked terrified <laughs> and he pretty much ran away. <laughs> anyway, that's a bit of a digression. <clears throat> Taking refuge in the Sangha may be related to devotion to the teachers. Yeah, I mean... I think we have to be careful to differentiate between taking refuge in a person and taking refuge in the qualities of that person, you know, and the same with the Sangha. I mean, the Sangha in the Buddhist um, text actually means the monastic Sangha. So to me, it more means, of course, the qualities, but specifically the quality of renunciation. So taking refuge in the Sangha as um, people who have renounced a lot more than we have as lay people you know there's that special quality that they have you know maybe there are other qualities that you have more of or or whatever but they've taken a very deep step in renunciation so that does imply a certain amount of letting go and a certain amount of wisdom and devote and and faith in the teachings and uh, the other thing i think we take refuge in the sangha for is the virtue because the sangha should be training um with many training uh guidelines which is my preferred uh, translation of Vinaya. Vinaya actually does literally mean like Vinaya, the sort of, what would you call that verb, the gerund or something? Vinaya loke means kind of restraining. So Vinaya is the same. It means restraint. Um, So that's what we take refuge in. And of course, if you find that somebody in the Sangha isn't living a life of virtue, then maybe they're not worth taking refuge in. You don't take refuge in just because they're wearing robes, right? Or just because they know a lot. But we can take refuge in certain qualities there. So 
the next comment says, I don't have the book with me, so I'm using Bhante Sajato's translations. And he starts the section on teacher to student relationship with. <laughs> this thing keeps popping up. Teachers served by their students in these five ways show compassion to them in five ways. I love the addition mm. of compassion. Mm. Yeah, that's really nice. What does mm. it say here? It does not say compassion. Mm -hmm. Doesn't, mm. does it? Good place. Yeah. I wonder where he got that from or whether that's actually missing from this. Because that's so really good. true. Yeah. I mean, mm. yeah. Have well, we actually mm. gone through the second bit about five ways that the teachers reciprocate have we done that mm -hmm. should we go into that a bit more because that's interesting too right we think about how we should treat our teachers but how should our teachers treat us so there are five ways in which their teachers thus ministered to by their pupils as the southern direction will reciprocate they will give thorough instruction, make sure they've grasped what they should have duly grasped, give them a thorough grounding in all the skills, recommend them to their friends and colleagues, and provide them with security in all directions. In this way, the southern direction is covered, making it secure and free from peril. Hmm. So I really like the idea that it's reciprocal, you know, that there's that it stems from this feeling of gratitude. It's never just a one way traffic. And I like when it says provide them with security as well, because I feel that's kind of the job, actually, of a monastic teacher, mm -hmm. if you take on um, students and trainees even guests right who come to stay for a short time we have to try to make sure that they have a place to stay that's comfortable and if we don't have a spare room we say okay will you be comfortable on the futon in the lounge and you know try to give you some time to rest um try to make sure there's enough dana coming in in terms of uh food supplies and that nobody feels unduly kind of pressured in any way and uh I always notice in retreats with Ajahn Brahm, you know, in the first interview, he's very rarely asking you about your meditation. He usually just asks, yeah, you know, is there enough food? Are you getting enough rest? And it's kind of surprising at first, you know, to hear that question from a teacher. You think, oh, isn't that a bit mundane? You know, isn't he going to ask about my meditation? But if you don't have food, if you're not healthy, if you don't have a place to sleep, how can you be expected to practice? So that's the first duty, actually, of a monastic teacher to their disciple. And that's one of the reasons so far with this project, I haven't been able to take anyone on because we're still in the process of trying to get me kind of fed and housed and, you know, in a fit position to actually be able to share the resources with other people. And it's it's giving me a great lot of joy to now actually have a place where people can come and stay and, uh, and join in the lifestyle of... Uh, a monastic community and hopefully benefit from that it's really beautiful but it takes a long time to uh, build up those resources so that there are enough to share and that's also why it's so important when there are resources to share them with everybody you know because there are a lot of monks in this country who you know have resources but if they're only sharing them with male uh, students you know and uh, yeah women can come and they might train you to a, a point but then it doesn't go further than that. The resources aren't fully shared, you know, or there's a fear of losing resources if they would, say, support bikinis, right? So then you feel that it's not actually, um, it's not good enough in a way. So, yeah, one of um, the wishes that I have is just that I can have a suitable place where people can practice and find the peace and, and get enough to eat and, you know, receive robes and, whatever is necessary to live a monastic life. And in a way, I mean, Ajahn Brahm often says that's his main job and that's what he does for his monks, you know, and nuns. Um, certainly for me, you know, he's given so much support to this project, not only, you know, at the level of trying to 
um, help with resources, but also at the emotional and spiritual level as well. Um, so it's really a commitment. In that sense, it's a bit like having children. <laughs> it's a bit like last week's uh, paragraph, to be honest. <laughs> uh, is there anything else on this? Or we could actually get off the teacher-student bit and get on to the next. Anything from here? No? All good? <laughs> All right. So we can always come back to any comments about that subject if you want to say anything else. So the next one, there are five ways in which a husband should minister to his wife. So this could also mean a husband to a husband or a wife to a wife. But in this case, you'll see there is a gender um, specific kind of division here based on the roles that were um, common in Indian society at that time. So five ways in which a husband should minister to his wife as the Western direction. Number one, by honouring her. Number two, by not disparaging her. Number three, by not being unfaithful to her. Number four, by giving authority to her. And number five, by providing her with adornments. <laughs> we all want a dormant right? we've got some adornments <laughs> everyone's really laughing here. <laughs> and there are five ways it doesn't say that for the wife I have to admit. <laughs> there are five ways in which a wife thus ministered to by her husband so first you have to do that for the wife before she's going to do it to you Thus ministered to by her husband, um, as the Western direction will reciprocate by properly organising her work, by being kind to the servants, by not being unfaithful, by protecting stores, and by being skillful and diligent in all she has to do. Mm, cue the laughter. <laughs> we'll have to translate this into, you know, something related in the modern day. <laughs> in this way, the Western direction is covered, making it secure and free from peril. So what do you think about that? And uh, goodbye to Rachel. It's no problem living, really. Any comments on that? <laughs> <laughs> How does it feel? <laughs> I feel like men need more adornment. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that comment? I thought that was great. <laughs> you said that they feel like men need more adornment. <laughs> it does seem a bit unfair, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, I'll come to Phil. <laughs> Well, men do seem to like adornments, it's true. <laughs> oh, Phil, we can't actually hear you. I don't know if you have um, your volume on or, you know, where you go to the little volume button, the mi the microphone? I don't know if yours is... Um... Do you want to try again or... Your type? Your type. Yeah. All right. We'll wait for you. No problem at all. Anything else on that? Mm. What do you think? Should we honour and not disparage, not be unfaithful, give authority to her? That's interesting. And provide her with adornment. Mm. Yeah. I always find it interesting that you give authority, even in the ancient Indian texts. Yes. I wonder if authority here refers to, like, I wonder if that is a word for respect as well. And the fact that there has to be a rule written about Respecting your wife is quite worrying, mm. um, and it very much mm. writes itself into patriarchy. And mm. I have a bit of, I don't know, I um, don't necessarily agree with old texts. Yeah, I think they're not very modern. And yeah. I had a bit of at a vipassana mm. retreat, the latest I did, I had a bit of like a I had a conversation with the teacher mm. where we didn't agree at all, and it was quite complicated mm. because. She, um, there was a whole conversation where one of the person who was serving as well 
we had a conversation with her and she asked, um, well, this whole teaching is about serving, serving, but as a woman and raised as a woman, where should I put boundaries? Because I feel like I need to put more boundaries than men do because we are already educated to mm. serve at all times. And how mm. do I do that? And the teacher said, mm. then, um, oh, like, you see, when I got married at first, um, I used to sometimes get upset at my husband when he would leave plates around and I would sometimes not agree with that and like have a go at him. But then I started meditating and I started practicing and now I just serve him all the time. And if he comes back from work and I ask him what he wants for lunch and he and I make him dinner and we were looking at her like, but there is this, there is this devotion and I agree. And at the same time, is it selflessness or is he doing that for you? Is it reciprocated? Mm -hmm. And shouldn't, if if the woman follows the man's lead, shouldn't he follow the woman's lead as well without it being requested, without yeah. like respect having to be written? Brilliant question, yeah. Did people hear that? Because that was mm -hmm. quite nuanced. I hope you did because it was, mm -hmm. yeah, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That is the danger, isn't it, if we move into just serving and mm. feeling that we're doing something virtuous and it's actually, mm. in a way, giving the wrong message to the husband yeah. and sort of not, yeah, helping, him. not helping them because mm. they start to take that for granted and, mm. yeah, perhaps don't necessarily reciprocate. I guess the idea yeah. is that they would reciprocate ideally, right, because there'd be that sense of gratitude. Mm. Um, but it depends on how a person's conditioned, I guess. Mm. And it's difficult to share something so personal as that teacher was doing because sometimes if you're mm. in a position as a teacher, mm. your words really can influence others. Mm. It's almost like you're hearing it mm. as the way one should be if mm. they're a meditator. And, again, they're just expressing their mm. personal experience mm. practice, and that mm. is not for everyone. So I think it's great that you're questioning that and, you know, not accepting that basically and, and um yeah, don't take that as an, a, a you know necessarily a, an example of how mm. a woman should be or anyone should be, right? If it was the other way around, the same. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think this is a fairly um, minor but maybe important point on the authority uh, condition. In my reading, that refers to the specific like legal authorities of the household and relates a lot to the fact that the wife looks after the stores yeah. and commands mm. the servants in a kind way. So mm. I, I think the something which is really interesting about like the wife and husband as a legal material setup mm. is very important mm. when friendship and teaching is kind of eternal and mm. not so like influenced by the state of mm. material affairs, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A particular role to play. It's like mm. a job kind of yeah. thing. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I think you're right as well with the authority being around that area of her work. It's almost like a delegation, and that this is your mm -hmm. particular area and this is mine, because certainly they're not giving authority in other areas, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's very much um, in those days about waking up first and, you know, serving everyone else yeah. and serving the husband, certainly. Yeah. yeah. I want to come to Phil because he had tried to um, speak. So um, this is, again, about Bhante Sajato's translation. A husband should serve his wife as the Western Quarter in five ways, by treating her with honour, by not looking down on her, by not being unfaithful, by relinquishing authority to mm. her, so that's interesting, instead of giving mm. authority. Mm. Um, and by presenting her with a dormant, okay, so that's nearly the same. <laughs> you can't change the words, even though Ben Sejato is a feminist. Um, <laughs> a wife served by her husband in these five ways shows compassion to him in five ways. So he's adding the compassion bit. I would like mm. to know the Pali if that's really in there. Mm. But I think it is obviously true to the meaning of this mm -hmm. she's well organized in her work she manages the domestic help so that's more specific mm -hmm. she's not unfaithful she preserves his earnings she is deft and tireless in all her duties mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think I like what Tab said. It's a particular mm. role that you're playing that is perhaps defined in society at that time. But mm. if you take it in that way, as opposed to an mm. absolute. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like it's not an yeah. eternal law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's like a job like description. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's how you do that job. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. And there's a note from um, Bikki Bodhi that I hadn't read out about this that says marriage is based on mutual care and respect, not on dominance and obedience, which is great, isn't it? And I think, you know, you were right about it's kind of disturbing in a sense that it's almost written down that you have mm. to honour and respect and not disparage. And yet in the same at the same time, it probably is a response to a very patriarchal mm. society. So mm. the Buddha's putting safeguards in there because they're needed. In the same way that in the Vinaya he does say, mm. you know, women shouldn't wash the robes of the monks mm. or a monk should not ask a bikini to wash their robes unless they're a relative or, you know, a bikini should not attend on a monk while they're eating. Because then I guess that was very common in ancient India that the woman would first allow the male to eat and then they would eat afterwards. So the Buddha wanted them both to be arms mendicants, both to eat. So I think some of it is kind of... Um, um, what's the word not reparative I don't know because that's not the word is it it's kind of to um uh restore what's the word I've gone tired mm. but uh yeah. yeah it's a response it's it's trying to um yeah you know what I mean <laughs> okay I'm gonna come to Benjamin hello hello um so I've been thinking about this as we've been going through the different paragraphs, thinking about the historical context and the fact that the Buddha is teaching to this specific young man. Mm, yeah. And at first reading these, I was kind of thinking, this seems too much a statement of the cultural norm mm. and not enough a statement of Dhamma. Mm. But then I've been thinking more about it and realising, actually, this seems like a really clever way to teach the Dhamma in an oblique way mm. where he's talking to this young man in terms that would probably be very familiar to him mm. and kind of stating something that's very close to what would normally be taught mm. but infusing it with these little nuggets of compassion mm. and respect that might normally not be there yeah mm. That's a lovely way to see it, yeah. Because yeah. we can say it's yeah more situational than straight dhamma, if you like. But mm. actually, isn't dhamma always applied mm. to any given situation? So that's a really nice way to see mm. it. It's kind of like, um, yeah, using mm. these things almost as examples. And perhaps mm. because we don't mm. know really exactly who he was speaking to, perhaps they were the areas that he this young man was actually neglecting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's mm -hmm. a really, really good point. Mm -hmm. Context is so mm -hmm. important. And I guess mm -hmm. this is what we often miss yeah. when we mm -hmm. read the suttas yeah. because we weren't there and the Buddha yeah. gave different teachings to everyone. You know, we have hopefully a lot of yeah. it in our hands, but we probably don't have the whole thing. And mm -hmm. some of it won't be absolutely true. Yeah. It won't be absolutely to the word. <laughs> you know, you can see even in Bhante Sajato's translation and this translation, a lot of it differs across translation as well so yeah context is so important and I think you know with the teachings in general we don't have to take on things that don't make sense we can leave it aside you know maybe at another time we might understand it it might make sense to us but we don't have to try to um, accept all of it you know the purpose actually is just to help us in our practice in the end isn't it so I think I'll carry on. What time is it? We've got another 10 minutes or so. Shall we do another um, paragraph? What do you think? Or is that too much? I think I should just go for it. No one's shaking their head. So this is about friendship. So this is very nice. And I'll change the word man to person. There are five ways in which a person should minister to their friends and companions as a northern direction. By gift by kindly words, by looking after their welfare, by treating them like themselves. 
and by keeping their word. And there are five ways in which friends and companions thus ministered to by a person in the northern direction will re reciprocate. By looking after them when they're inattentive, by looking after their property when they're inattentive, <laughs> <laughs> by being a refuge when they're afraid, by not deserting them when they're in trouble, and by showing concern for their children. In this way, the northern direction is covered, making it secure and free from peril. Mm. That's really nice, isn't it? I like that. Because, of course, in any friendship, both of you are the friend. So it means, in a sense, you're doing all ten, <laughs> all of these things. Yeah. And also this sentence about, you know, growing the northern direction, making it secure and free from peril. I think, again, it's all in the theme of harmony, isn't it? It's all about um, ensuring that relationships are harmonious. So some of what we've read before about the delega delegation or of duties can also be just a way of having a simple and harmonious life. So there aren't too many arguments and um, disputes. But yeah, I think this is beautiful because all of us are friends to someone and all of us have mm. friends with others. And um, for me anyway, one mm. of the ways that uh, I know somebody's a true friend is uh, one of the things that I find really important is that they do keep their word. You know, if somebody says they're going to do something, they actually do. Mm. It's that sense of loyalty. That's one of the things with Ajahn Brown that I can 100% guarantee, actually. Mm. But if he says he'll do something, he's so reliable. It's amazing. Even down to being totally on time always. And it's one of the things I love about when we travel together. You know, if you say you're going to be somewhere, try to be there. And that's a kind of part of ethics, I think. It's not just not lying. It's also whatever you say, you try to um, stay true to that and be uh, reliable. It gives me, anyway, an incredible feeling of safety to know that that person will indeed be there when they say they will. Mm. And uh, the other thing that I really like is not deserting a person when they're in trouble, being a refuge when they're afraid, even looking after their property or whatever when the other one's inattentive. It's like, mm. that's very relevant always, isn't it? If someone's kind of standing mm. around and they've left their bag on the floor and you just pick it up, hey, you know, take the bag, <laughs> uh, drop their phone. <laughs> lost their key or whatever um but yeah friendship isn't always about feeling good and having fun that's very superficial you know you can sometimes you sometimes think you have a true friend and then when you go through a difficult patch it's amazing sometimes people you didn't think were such good friends really come forward and stay loyal and at other times people you did think were friends get influenced wrongly against you and just desert you and it's quite a an eye-opener I think isn't it when we sort of notice how yeah. people respond in times of trouble mm -hmm. yes I think it's interesting how much the friendship paragraph is so much more universal and so much less context bound yeah. yeah but at the same time they're all the same rules exactly they're just different like they're just formulated different and less legally bound but the loyalty is the same, the mm. care to mm. the material properties of others is the same, the care to the immaterial mm. properties of others mm. is the same, mm. and in the end, it's just love, mm. or care, or, That's or both. Mm. And it's funny how that also worked with the teacher. I mean, yeah. all of them sort of yeah. weave it into each other, and yeah. both yeah. people can mm. be the same. Thing. Right, right. I think you've got it there, actually. Mm. Because um, I don't know if everybody heard that. Did you hear sort of that mostly? Not everyone's mm -hmm. nodding, but I think you know the idea that however it's described, it's essentially the same message. Some are more um, kind of legally bound. Some are a bit more time specific, maybe context specific. Um, the friendship one seems less so, but they're all essentially about mm -hmm. the same thing: looking after the other person, respecting mm -hmm. the other person, taking care of their property. Um, you know, being loyal, being responsible, mm -hmm. and ultimately loving, being loving. 
you know, and, and that is why Van Giotto's translation is nice there when it mm. says these are the ways we show compassion. Because mm. that's really what the practice mm. is about. And I think yeah. in a way, mm. it's not as relevant what we do for another. And sometimes we might think, oh, this shouldn't be my role. I shouldn't have to do it this way. Mm. If we can look beyond the actual physical activity and look at the meaning behind it and look at it as a way to express care, mm. then everything takes on a deeper meaning. Mm. I remember years ago, because I used to feel that my family didn't really speak about anything particularly deep. And I was always quest- kind of, what's the word? Um, I'm very tired today, so I can't get my words. Please forgive me. Um, I kind of had this insatiable thirst for meaning (laughs) and I wanted it quenched and I couldn't get it quenched and it used to irritate me when we talk about kind of superficial things and I suppose I was really obnoxious in that way and kind of Mm yeah arrogant in a way right because I had my friend and then we dig to the depth of what life was all about and we talk proper stuff you know but then once I realized in the car where it was just like a bit of chit chat that's just a way the words are just irrelevant it's just a means of expressing affection Mm. and then I saw it quite differently Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. I still get a bit irritated with chit chat (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but sometimes it's just we're trying to connect with yeah. one another yeah we might get it wrong we might say something stupid but mm. actually a lot of the time people are just trying to connect mm. even people that get angry with one another I've noticed mm. you know mm. what do you think you are mm. giving you a look it's actually a kind of invitation to mm. to and connect it, yeah because mm. you're disconnected and you think yeah like, what's wrong why yeah. are we not connected yeah <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> But mm. it's not okay, is it, to say it, to be vulnerable and to mm. ask. Mm. Mm. I'm starting to learn that. I have to ask if I want some support, you know, mm. and not just expect people will notice. Mm. Yeah, quite often you think they know what I'm thinking. Yeah, surely <laughs> they know that I'm stressed <laughs> and I just want them to, you know, <laughs> do this or do that. But sometimes, yeah, can we ask and not get irritated before we ask? <laughs> we'll wait till we necessarily take it to us. <laughs> so the Pali has been discovered. Imehi kal gaha patipu panchahi hanehi antavasina dakina disa. Okay, I'm not going to try and read all the Pali. Acharya pachipatita panchahi hanehi. Antevasim anukampanti. So the word anukampa is there. Yeah. So the word anukampa, it's nice that the word anukampa is used for compassion because anukampa always has an active sense. Mm-hmm. So it's not just sitting around developing feelings of compassion, but mm-hmm. it's like showing it in action. And it was always said that the Buddha taught out of anukampa. So it's almost like it also means literally kampa means shake or tremble. Anu is like small, small like tiny, mm. or it can mean along with, but I think it, in this context, anukampa means like small tremble of, trembles. And it's something that rouses you. It's something that kind of, you know, and you feel it and you feel the compassion in your heart or you feel the metta in your heart and it becomes stronger and it becomes stronger and you have to say something or you have to do something. Mm. And that is what motivated the Buddha to teach. So that's really beautiful that it's mm. out of anukampa. Yeah. Teachers served by their students in these five ways show anukampa to them. Mm. I like that word instead because you know mm. that that person is suffering in mm. some way. Yeah. Then behaving yeah, yeah. not right or whatever mm. according to your books, but actually out of compassion because you know deep down that they are suffering. Mm. So. Yeah, and then it's easier, isn't it, to do all these things without resentment or yeah. resistance, you know. We do them to alleviate the suffering of their particular mm. role, perhaps. Mm. You know, like a teacher's particular suffering sometimes mm. can be just that they always have to be available mm. for everybody, right? And, mm. and you know, so much expectation on them and so much kind mm. of, you just can't have your own life, basically. And if somebody's around who's just by your side quietly and just you know kind Mm. of here's some water or whatever they don't even have Mm. to say it right it's Mm. just very beautiful and um, it's compassion because it's alleviating the suffering it's just Mm. cooling things Mm. down in a way yeah with the teacher student one it also came to mind because 
the way it's phrased there, it's like the teachers show the students compassion by ministering or vice versa. But in a way, it can be compassionate to let another person minister to us, can't it? Mm. It's not just that we minister to them in these mm. ways out of compassion. Mm. We also allow them to be mm. the person serving us. Mm. That's mm. compassionate too, because mm. it gives a person an opportunity. Mm. Yeah, getting hold of it too. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, I'm sure Ajahn Chah doesn't need all these monks holding his <laughs> but he does it for their sake. Yeah, exactly. So someone's asking something which resonates. Yeah, Anukampa means resonate as well. It means kind of empathy, right? Resonating. Or I like Ajahn Chah's translation. He calls it um, uh, sympathetic resonance. I actually think it's more like empathetic resonance, but it's a bit more than that too English is so limited in a way because it's also compassion in the Buddhist teachings is about um focusing on that person's freedom from suffering so you don't just feel what they feel or feel sad with them or you understand how they feel so there's an empathy element but that motivates a wish for their freedom from suffering so the compassion is always like it lifts you and actually mm-hmm. they say that in the ordination may you lift me up out of compassion mm-hmm. when you join the um is it the bikini sangha isn't it when you take yeah, the full you ordination yeah anukampam upadaya may the sangha lift me up out of compassion and it's so beautiful because you feel like you've been lifted into this community of people who are all practicing together and who are going to support you and you're going to support as well um so it's something that elevates the mind and elevates the happiness in the world so that's very nice and there's two more paragraphs there about servants and masters or mistresses or whatever's and the way that we administer to aesthetics and brahmins so this would include monastics so we'll do that next week. In fact, you'll get to do that because next week I'll be in Gaia House and I will have an attendant called Shell who's here right now and that's wonderful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so she will attend to my needs and I will do my bit as well. I have to make sure that you get enough food. I won't eat it all, okay? <laughs> and um, and uh, yeah, I'll be back a couple of weeks from now um so yeah the venerable chanda thank you very much and also to venerable Pekka for all these rich teachings and for giving us opportunity to discuss and understand the teachings deeper so discuss as well as question um that way we could understand it much deeper and as you know today's sutta discussion was offered on the donation basis in the spirit of generosity. This is an opportunity for us to practice generosity in any way we can afford and whatever way we can. Generosity develops. Developing the generosity gives our mind joy and energy, and then we can carry that generosity to our meditation cushion. With your generosity, Anukampa Bhikkhuni Project and Venerable Chanda and all the future Bhikkhunis can provide community and wide world very valuable Dhamma talks, teachings, meditation retreats, and you know many of the teachings are in YouTube and in BSWA. So um, we are a part of those, um, you know, helping Venerables to do those um, uh, Dhamma teachings. So if you would like to support the monastery and the Sangha's requisite, you're invited to donate. And I put the link below and um, I'll put it again. And um, so, as you know, we are moving to a a new monastery and, um, um, you know, in March, uh, very exciting. Uh, mm-hmm. But then the new new mm-hmm. monastery means, you know, a little bit higher costs than uh, the standard terraced house in Oxford. So, um, so standing orders are particularly helpful if you can afford any amount, even an amount of a coffee uh, that you can donate is not too small and will be very valuable and received with much, much metta. You can make donations um, uh, um you can do a standing order when you are doing the bank account and you, if you indicate that. 
Um, and the other main need these days is getting food, and it will be a bigger need when we go when 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 the Vihara moves to the Anukampa Grove Monastery, because that place doesn't have much supermarkets close by. And there is a WhatsApp group to get involved if you are able to. It is called Afar, Anukampa Food at the Ready. So I'm going to put a link of that. And uh, if you want to get involved with that, please contact team at anukampaproject.org. There you are. And uh, and also there is a list of needed items if you um, you know move around in the website. And uh, so if there's any urgent needs, they are there as well. Uh, you don't have to go there. You can, uh, you can buy it from any standard supermarket in the UK and uh, deliver it wherever you are. You don't have to be in Oxford. And uh, even the dana, if you want to give dana, there's a dana calendar. And if you're far away, you can organize that remotely as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. That means food uh, offerings. Yes. And a lot of people do that. So, yeah. so um, also, I, I do want to answer Chi's question if anybody's, um, I did say your name on the recording. Is that okay? Just shake your head if it's not. Okay. Seems all right. Um, and also tell you about tomorrow. So first, I'll just quickly address this question. It'll only be brief. I'm really sorry that I can't go into it in detail. It's a wonderful question. It's just that I know people might have to go. Um, but the question is that if we come across a teacher whose teachings or guidance seems to be geared towards a particular group much more than others, mm -hmm. let's say one gender, race or culture, how might we know if it's coming from a wholesome place or some bias? Mm. Last question, please. That is quite a deep question. The how might we know is really tricky and nuanced, but just broad strokes, I would say you have to be more alert to the possibility that it's coming from bias if it caters more to a dominant group, most probably. And I personally feel, this is a bit controversial perhaps, but I personally actually don't really think that we should have male-only monasteries. In the same way, it wouldn't be appropriate to have female, uh, black or well, white-only monasteries. Sorry, I'm so tired now, but I mean white-only monasteries. Because they're dominant groups who already get a lot of access to resources much more than most you wouldn't have like a straight only monastery right I mean you might actually unfortunately mm -hmm. and um it isn't right so I would say in a sense it's natural that if a teacher is a white male they'll have mostly white white male disciples simply because often we go for people who we relate to best so sometimes there's that element too but if they actually exclude other people intentionally, then we have to ask questions. I would say if it's, say, groups of people of colour or women's monasteries, it's different because we don't have the same access to resources in the first place. We actually need our own spaces because we don't have those safe places where we can really, you know, learn in ways that suit us mm -hmm. um, and maybe have the support from people who understand what our particular types of suffering or challenges or even you know joys that we experience right so sometimes we need to flock together with others who are like us and again you know there is going to be a nuns only monastery I mean it's not only for nuns it's for all people as well but the only people I can be ordaining are, are bikinis I'm not going to start opening up to monks because monks have like I don't know how many monasteries in this country alone. I mean, there's a UK Sangha Trust in this country. UK Sangha Trust means monks. They don't include bikunis in that. And the nuns are only supported by that trust because they're allowed to be in those monasteries by the monks. Mm -hmm. They don't own those monasteries. They have no right to be there unless they, um, and the monks agree to it and the monks give them certain conditions. Mm -hmm you know, that they have to agree to in order to stay. And one of those conditions is that they don't ask for bikuni ordination. So they can only stay if they agree to be novices forever and ever and ever, basically. Mm -hmm. They actually have higher training than novice training, but that's the situation. So 
Mm. I think there's a place for, you know, more um for more um support and resources and facilities for women, for people of color, for people from the LGBTQI plus communities. Um, and I would really um say we need those people represented more. Um but again, you know, it's not easy to know straight away because we can't see another person's intention straight mm-hmm. away. So you have to find mm-hmm. out that over time. But mm-hmm. as a basic guide, I think if you don't feel comfortable in a place and you've tried that a few times and that is affecting mm-hmm. your practice, try not to justify that and try and look for something else, mm-hmm. you know, that, mm-hmm. that will feel safe and inclusive and welcoming to you who you are, the way you are. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. That's a big question but it's something that's important to at least touch on now. So thank you for that question. It's a, how might we know if it's coming from a wholesome place or some bias? Yeah. I mean, even for the monks, it's not always coming from bias. I mean, like Ajahn Brahm's monastery is monks only. I don't think it came from bias. It just came because he was conditioned that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and he thought that would be the best mm-hmm. way to train monks, you know. Um I don't know now whether he would always necessarily think that is the best way. I mean, there are also dual Sangha monasteries that he supports. Um, uh, so in that case, I wouldn't say it's coming from bias and he does his best to support mm. Bikunis as well. But of course, it still can hurt. It can hurt me a lot. I mean, I've been through so much suffering through not being able to live with my teacher just because of my gender. I mean, it's like I've sort of accepted it at this point because I realise I do get access but most bikinis don't get much access and it's not because he's a monk it's because of his depth of understanding the dhamma and that is easier if, you know you can have Ajahn Brahm even live with him if you're a monk if you're male not if you're female so it's painful yeah mm. yeah at another time if the males discriminate against women doesn't that run counter to the Buddha's teachings yeah, I don't know what you mean about another time, but um, I do think there's something a little bit missing in a person's practice if they're actually adamantly against including bhikkhunis. Either it's, a, in my mind, my perspective, a misunderstanding of the Vinaya, of the what the Buddha laid down and his intention to include women from the beginning. Um, it could be that or it could be outright discrimination, yeah, so... I mean, if if a person is adamantly saying that, you know, bhikkhunis shouldn't really be around and we don't want them and they're all, you know, committing an offence that they're not committing. One monk was saying this on my Facebook page yesterday. <laughs> Apparently he does this a lot to different bhikkhunis and says that we've done this offence, which is like going out on our own. He's misunderstanding certain some some nuances in the Vinaya according to our understanding, but mm. of course people understand things differently. Um, I'm not really attracted to those people as teachers personally. They have some good qualities, but they're not enlightened in my mind. And this is hard to say right in, without being judgmental, but to me it doesn't engender faith, you know, because I'm not sitting around all day worrying about what other people are doing and yeah, worrying that other people are getting access to the Dhamma or worrying that other people are having the opportunity to live a monastic life. I mean, if you've benefited from something, you want to share that. You don't want to prohibit other people having the same access. That's my opinion. Um, so, I don't know. What do you think? What do you think? What do I think? Mm. I can't I can't think at the moment. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Nothing? No. Okay. All right. So I will finish by saying that tomorrow morning uh we have a meeting about the new monastery with Ajahn Brahm and me and Venerable Pekka. And uh you're welcome to join if you haven't already registered. The information is now in the chat box so you can register and it's you know mainly going to be kind of getting to the nitty-gritty of what's needed to support us going forward and a bit about where we're at and um hopefully it's just an inspiring time to share with one another so look forward to that so take care everybody (laughs) and uh may your practice flourish Mm -hmm. see you soon 
I should probably say for anyone who's yet still here that um, there is still place in my retreat in London. There's a retreat in London that I'd forgotten about till about two days ago on the 24th. Is it the 24th of January, uh, February? I'd actually forgotten because I'm moving house and putting this this one on the market and I've got so much other stuff and it's just, but yes, if anyone wants to come to that, there's still place. Okay, let's unmute you and we'll wave goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.